Still the worst of my nightmares. Forty years later and I'm still waking in a cold sweat. They're going to catch me. And this time it won't just be the cruel torture and all. These people are cruel. I've seen them disembowel a living man and light a fire of fine shavings in his stomach and cook him to death. And they're going to catch me. <laughs> I got away. I hid in a hollow tree and they passed just feet away. Four days they hunted me until eventually I found a farm. I knew the man there, John Bell, but he nearly shot me for a savage when he saw me. But I came back to, well, you could call it civilization. Although, you know, one of the reasons those Indians went on these murdering, scalping parties was that we civilized people, British and French, paid them for every scalp they took from the enemy. <laughs> well, there was a disaster. A French scalp and a British scalp, <laughs> they looked pretty much the same. Ah, and as far as the Indians were concerned, they couldn't tell the difference between Frenchy talk and English talk anyway. Still, I'm getting ahead of myself. What's an old man in Edinburgh talking about escaping from Indians for? And you're right to wonder, because I'd no business being there. Kidnapping. That was what they called it. That's just what happened to me. I was just ten years old when I went to Aberdeen from Hunley. That's, that's where I was born, in the parish of Arboyne. And I went to stay for a while with my aunt in Aberdeen. And, of course, I, <laughs> I ended up down the docks. Well, all life was down those docks. And, of course, a boy would end up down there, gawping at the sights. And, of course, they knew that gangs of men who would find you wandering alone and that was the last you were seen of spirited away into the hold of a ship do you understand they just took you are you understanding this I became a slave in Aberdeen at the age of 13 and the people knew it was happening of course they knew. The authorities, the baileys, the men in the council, the merchants, the Anka Gid. They were behind it. It was them that was selling us to the plantations in the new world, stealing children and selling them. Well, of course, officially, we were not slaves. We were indentured servants. People who, because we could not afford passage to the new world, would sell our labor for seven years and expect to get freedom and some property and a wee start at the end of it. <laughs> if you lived to the end of it, which was the first challenge, without the skin being flayed off your back by a cruel maester, and there's worse could happen to a lassie. But we didn't want to go. There were 69 of us kidnapped children on board the planter as she left Aberdeen in 1743. Slaves is what we were, and I doubt many of them ever saw freedom again. Freedom? We very nearly didn't see America. Shipwrecked. The crew was okay, they left us, battened down in the hold while the ship foundered on the sandbank and they took to the boats. They came back for us the following day when the storm died down. And I was sold. Knocked down for a good price. Well, I tell you, I could have done a lot worse than Hugh Wilson, a humane, honest and worthy man. Which is to say that I felt his lash often enough when I deserved it. And I was worked hard. 
but he'd been a slave himself, kidnapped like me, years before in Perth. And when he died, just before I'd served my time, he left me his best horse and saddle and some money and all his clays. And there I was, free. Well, you'd call it free, but not able to go home. The, the human traffic across the Atlantic was, was all one way in those days. I married. I married well and took a farm, 200 acres on the Pennsylvania frontier. I thank God my wife wasn't there the night they came. A murdering party. I don't know why they didn't kill me. I, I begged for my life when they took me. For a pack animal. I was a slave again, tied up and tethered and treated worse than the dogs. I had to fight for my wee scraps of food. I was with them for a year before I escaped. The first night they forgot to tether me. Maybe they thought they'd tortured and beaten my desire for freedom out of me. Or maybe they just didn't give it a thought. To them I was just a pack animal. But I could run. And for three years after that in the army I hunted them in my turn. I joined the army that was fighting the French and the Indians. Well, my, my farm was gone, my wife had died, and by 25 years old, the only talent I had to offer was brutality. So I joined the army. <laughs> and I was captured again, this time by the French, the Battle of Oswego. And that's how I came home, as an exchanged prisoner of war. I walked from Plymouth to Aberdeen. Sometimes to get a bit of money, I would dress as an Indian and do war dances until a crowd gathered. And I would tell my story <laughs> and sell my wee book. And when I got back to Aberdeen, 15 years after being spirited away, oh, oh, they did not want to know me. Those respectable merchants and baileys and provost. I was thrown in the jail and my book was burnt. I wasn't given up. I sued the council in the court of session in Edinburgh and I won. And I made them pay 100 pounds plus costs. When they looked into it, they found that more than 600 children had been taken from Aberdeen to the colonies in six years, until the Battle of Culloden. After Culloden, there were enough Highlanders to fill the boats. God help them. And after I sued the Council of Aberdeen as a whole for what they'd been doing, I found out the names of the men who had sold me, and I sued them as well. Oh, <laughs> they tried their old tricks. The judge who had to settle the case was wined and dined all over Edinburgh before he gave his verdict against me and then collapsed dead, drunk and speechless. I wouldn't let them away with it. I had justice eventually. 200 pounds damages and 100 guineas legal costs. Well, they could afford it. Six hundred wains sold into slavery over six years. Aye, they could well afford it. I stayed in Edinburgh, ran a tavern, occasionally gave an Indian show, ran a postal service, blocked a printing press, published a newspaper. I could sell our thing to anybody. I made money. But you can't buy your childhood back. I sit in the tavern and I tell my story and people say to me when they listen to my stories, by what, Peter, they say, by what? You've led some life, eh? What a life. 
and the right, of course. I have led a life. But you see, it wasn't my life. My life ended on the quayside at Aberdeen when I was just 13 years old. Because 60 years later, I look back at that wee loon, terrified in the hold of that boat, and I wonder, what would he have made of himself? What might he have become? I close my eyes at night, and my dreams are full of madness and murder. When you're a slave, you're future belongs to someone else and even your dreaming sleep is not your own the colonies are gone now gone in bloodshed dressed up in fine words we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that amongst these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, happiness. These are bought and sold in the quayside at Aberdeen. 